everyone. Welcome to TIA's Global Dialogue. My name is Akitoshi Miyashita. I'm a dean of uh, TIU's English Track Program. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Professor Tom Lee from Pomona College. He will be speaking uh, about Japan's aging uh, peace uh, based on his dissertation and its uh, book he uh, published last year. Uh, Professor Lee uh, did his undergraduate at University of California, uh, Davis, and then he moved on to the uh, UC Irvine to get his PhD. And um, it's my pleasure to uh, say that uh, one of his uh, PhD advisors was uh, my friend, uh, Professor Robert Uliu, Bob Uliu. And uh, so we have a common <laughs> uh, a, a person. Um, topic is very interesting, timely, and uh, we are all thrilled to hear uh, Professor Lee uh, speaking about the Japan's uh, uh, national security policy. So without further ado, uh, Professor Lee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Nyashita, um, and thank you, TIU, for having me here. It's really an honor and privilege. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, Japan's aging peace, pacifism, and militarism in the 21st century. Uh, I'd like to start by kind of giving a, a little bit of a tidbit. Actually, the, the original dissertation, uh, the idea uh, for it, uh, came from an article that Professor uh, Nyashita wrote uh, that I read as a graduate student and I really planted the seeds uh, for the idea. So I, it's kind of an honor for me to meet him and uh, see how, you know, how he tilled the ground and how some ideas such as mine are able to, to come from it. So uh, I'm excited to present and also for, to take the questions uh, on the argument. Uh, before I get into the argument itself, I always love to acknowledge my research assistants at Pomona College. I had, uh, this book is a passion project of mine, but it's not possible with the, my many uh, students who have worked as research assistants uh, on this. Uh, as you can see, these uh, lovely faces here, just really doing a lot of the hard work. So I don't have to do as much hard work. Uh, and then here's the other set as well. So I've had uh, 15, 20 students that, uh, that I brought in uh, on this project. So the, 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 the plan for today is I'll, I'll provide some context and some literature so we could have a setting to talk about what does Japanese security policy look like in the world that we live in. I'll present my research question and then some theories and concepts that I, I work on to, I think, make it easier for us to digest uh, what is going on because our theories and concepts simplify very complex things. Uh, and, and because the reality is always gonna be more complex than what the, the book says. And then we'll get into the heart of the argument and I, I divide security policy in terms of hardware and software. And I have four different categories, but for today, I would like to talk about demographics and then in software, I'd like to talk about rules and rule. So let's take a look at the regional politics. So if we're looking at Japanese security policy, if we, we read uh, the popular news, what people like to always focus on is like, of course, Japan is militarizing. It has many reasons to do so. It's the should is I think what people focus on. And they'll, talk, they'll look at North Korea and its nuclear program and the historical issues that they've had, uh, Japan has had with North Korea. So you have the abduction issue, right? I, I think if you think about it, abduction is the, one of the ultimate violations of a state's sovereignty. So even though if it's not many people, uh, the fact that someone can do that to your citizenry uh, is significant. Uh, then we can look at China as the rising China narrative is that, of course, Japan needs to militarize in order to balance China. This is a very classical argument. There's a power transition where China has uh, overtaken Japan economically and militarily. Uh, China is showing more confidence in asserting its interests uh, within the region. And then there's also some concerns about uncertainty with the U.S. alliance, especially after the Trump administration. And then we have a very tangible evidence uh, of how China's footprint in the region can be problematic. I know there's a specialist here at TIU, I think Jeffrey or Daniel works on uh, island disputes and things like that. And so you can see how th this is an island that's being developed by the Chinese uh, where it's, it's clearly uh, impactful. It's a very tangible evidence of a militarized region. 
If we look at defense spending in East Asia, you can see in the blue bars that China's military expenses as a share of re- uh, spending in the region has grown, whereas Japan has declined significantly, right? In comparison, right? So we're looking at relative power, uh, relative spending, uh, which is the first sign of, hey, maybe Japan should be increasing its capabilities. Uh, if you look at kind of the, the normative, or not normative, but the, the relational uh, situation in East Asia as well, um, opinions between Japanese and Chinese are increasingly unfavorable. So not only is it the hardware a potential concern for Japan, but also attitudes between the two countries that may justify more militaristic behavior as conventionally defined. Then you look at the global politics and security. So the US-Japan alliance, like how many pivots towards Asia is necessary before Japan feels confident that it needs to increase its capabilities because of a demand by the US alliance, or if there isn't a pivot, does the Japanese have to be more autonomous with their security capabilities? And then there's also the diverse security threats of terrorism, cybersecurity, environmental insecurity, human security, and rocky relationships with uh, South Korea, where other reasons why Japan must should consider increasing its capabilities, right? So I think the literature does a great job at pointing at this really long laundry list of reasons why the Japanese should be building up their capabilities. I think the last administration before President Biden with President Trump really had the Japanese concern, not only because of what he said, but no one saw this presidency coming. And the Americans did a pretty bad job at explaining to its allies that this was a real possibility. Uh, You look at some of the rhetoric by President Trump, right? One, One famous quote is, as far as Japan and other countries, we are being ripped off by everyone in the, uh, in the world where uh, you know, he never finished the sentence. We're defending other countries, we're spending a fortune and he was pushing Japan to spend more. Uh, what's interesting about this, and I, this, this is what really concerns I think Japanese politicians and politicians around the world is, President Trump is thinking of running again, right? And recently, if you paid attention to his quotes, he mentioned how the Japanese are spending more on their military, they're possibly a threat, right? So he's trying to have it both ways where Japan's not doing enough and Japan's doing so much. And as an ally, that can be quite unnerving where you have to think about detethering yourself from the United States and having some independent capabilities. Uh, So if we look at these Japanese security concerns very broadly, uh, what I like to look at is, you know, all those traditional things, but also within the country, there's the security concerns of your social security of the population declining as well, right? Work-life marriage uh, balance. uh, social issues that a country can be concerned about. If you look at state security, you have rising China, North, nuclear, North Korea, terrorism, and piracy, as I, I spoke of earlier. You look at environmental security, especially with climate change, this is increasingly a problem around the world. Uh, and Japan in particular is quite vulnerable because of its location. And then you look at economic security, and not just competition with China, uh, in terms of uh, supply chains and getting access to the uh, adequate resources to maintain this economy, but also even with allies, you know, just a couple of years ago, Japan and South Korea were in that very bitter trade dispute uh, that could affect it all. But if you pay attention to these four uh, issues, they interconnect, right? Your environmental security is tied to your economic security. Your economic security is tied to your state security. Your social security is significant for your economic security. So I think we have to think about it holistically. And I, from my research, I would say that Japanese government does think about these things holistic, holistically. Uh, and so within the past uh, decade, really, uh, the Japanese government has responded to many of these security concerns. They established the National Security Council, which is a permanent apparatus to deal with these uh, global threats. Uh, they came up with the national security strategy, updated its terms with the United States. Uh, under Prime Minister Abe, he advocated for a proactive peace, which is finding a way to have Japan have a bigger footprint uh, around the world. And then you have, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific strategy that the Japanese started pushing uh, for uh, almost a decade now, where you can see there's these shifts. So if you look at The reasons to change, plus what has been done, it almost seems like an open and shut case. Of course, Japan is militarizing. Um, uh, And I would like to problematize that. So let's take a look at this quick data point. So this is the Defense of Japan um, white paper, right? And you can see uh, uh, it started in 1970 and it took like a five year break. Um, The length of it has increased over time. 
which shows at face value, a, a very cursory analysis that security is becoming a bigger thing, right? Japan is becoming more sophisticated. But what this book tries to do is if you look into it, where is Japan spending its energies? What are they talking about when it comes to security? They, when they talk about spending on military, that's one thing, but they also talk about how do they incorporate more women into the self-defense force, right? They talk about how does Japan participate in PKOs legally? How can they uh, allocate the proper resources, not to just balance against China, but also to deal with disasters and, and, and help Southeast Asia deal with disaster relief as well? So the defense story is actually much more complex than Japan's militaristic or not. So if we look at the literature, right, if you look at uh, traditionally, this is what I, I, I am engaging with is uh, some scholars look at uh, the inter international environment, security identity, the kind of big picture kind of things. Then you look at um, those that look at alliance relationships and politics. And then you look at domestic issues such as public opinion, uh, things such as that. Uh, and then if we look at the popular press, they have definitely accepted this narrative. This is within the last couple of years where the Atlantic says Japan's path towards militarization, the New York Times, the pacifist Japan starts to embrace the military. This is the popular narrative that of course Japan is militarizing because it has no choice. Or what I think is more problematic is that this is the natural thing that states do. And I don't think that's the case. So my research question is, let's take this broad and, and ask what determines the content and direction of Japanese security policy? Specifically, how is force legitimized? So when a policy is passed, how is it pitched towards the public? And then I look at material factors and ideational factors, and I look at the evolving anti-militaristic culture. So we, we ask, should Japan militarize? But rarely do we ask how or if it's possible. And so the premises that I have in my argument is that securities policy is um, what a state can do as much as what it should do. So we can pay attention to that. I'd argue that politics is ultimately normative. And this might be the most controversial thing. And I know it is because I got a lot of pushback when I was trying to pitch this book from lots of folks is that anti-militarism is a type of militarism, right? Unless you're deontologically against violence, like a true full body pacifist, then you're not really anti-militaristic, you're not against the military, right? Japan accepts the use of the military for specific circumstances. So I think it's a problem when someone says that Japan is militarizing or not. Uh, they're militaristic. It's more about type and what they are willing to use the, for, uh, uh, the security forces for. Uh, and so my argument is what determines security policy, not just for Japan, but all states is the interactions between the physical and the ideational variables, uh, what I call the anti-militarism ecosystem. Uh, and over time, it gets reified and becomes stronger. And I'll, I, hopefully I can make a convincing case uh, in this talk today. Uh, and I use the analogy of hardware and software. So we have our hardware components and then we have our software components, All right? So let's take a look at the software components. And I, I use uh, the literature on norms and rules, but uh, so we, we take a look at norms, right? This is like a standard set of behaviors that we find acceptable. Uh, so, and norms are shared, right? So for instance, this says, uh, this classic painting is says, this is not a pipe, but it is a pipe, right? But it, only because we've kind of agreed upon what a pipe is as a conceptual truth. Right? So things can be real if it's not physically the case, because what you're looking at on the screen, on your end of the screen here is a bunch of zeros and ones, right? It's, all, it's, all, it's in the ether, right? Um, but what I take for the book is I take Nicholas Ono's original constructive argument, and I think it's not just norms, but they're really rules, right? Think about it this way, laws, norms, taboos, policies, those are all rules. They're, they're guidelines for how we should behave in society. And when a country is trying to justify its military use, it's different groups in society fighting on writing those rules to determine what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. So let me show how these rules can have a, a relationship with the physical environment. So I, I take the example of basketball, right? In basketball, you have a court that's 90 feet across um, and you have 10 seconds 
to bring the, I think it's like 13 seconds now, but like 10 seconds to bring the ball from the front of the court to the midway court or you lose, uh, you lose your ball, right? So that's a rule that's defined by physical space. You have to traverse a certain amount of uh, area and also by time, which is a, uh, the, 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 the limit. However, what players learned to do with this rule was, well, I could just roll the ball down the court and not touch it. And then the, the clock doesn't start until I touch it. So they interpreted the rule in a specific way in order for them to behave in a certain way. Yet, it's still bound by the physics of time and space, right? So rules are not completely separated from the material world that we live in. Those two things are uh, inter, uh, interconnected. Uh, you know, Professor Miyashita's uh, article from years ago that I read that was the inspiration for this, he argued that, yeah, there's this anti-militaristic attitude in Japan, but where do those norms come from and how are those norms possible to be sustained? And he argued that it was the U.S.-Japan alliance that provides a certain environment where Japan could be comfortable pursuing this, uh, these uh, attitudes, right? And he, he looked at polling data that showed an ebb and flow from it. And I, I took that argument and I expanded it to look at, well, other things can also influence how Japanese think about security. So if we look at that, this ecosystem, the first component that we'll focus today is the aging and declining population. So that's a physical thing, right? Your population gets smaller, right? However, Japan also has Article 18, which is no conscription, right? That's a, that's a rule, that's a policy in the state, but that is particularly powerful in Japan because the population is declining and you have this rule that exacerbates that population decline, decline problem. But in South Korea and China and Taiwan and Russia, they also have declining populations too. Yet their rules are different. They have conscription, right? So you don't have that same problem with recruitment, right? So you can see how rules and the, the physical world interact differently. Then I would look at the technical infrastructural, which is if Japan's gonna militarize, it should build its own weapons, right? Uh, and also, uh, you know, have a military industrial complex, but it's really hard to do that if you haven't fought a major war in over 75 years, you can't just activate that. So your experience affects kind of the physical technology that you can have. Then I would look at the political, this is on the northern end, the software side, which is, you know, the US Japan Alliance, Japan neutrality in East Asia, international stigma as uh, things that influence Japan as well. And then lastly, I look at uh, the peace culture, which is like the activists, the anti-nuclear uh, activity um, and policies such as um, the spending limit on the self-defense force and arms export ban. So let's take a look at um, the concept that I'd like to propose today, which is a multi-militarism concept. Normally we look at militarism as passivism and militarism on a spectrum and we go from one to the other. But as we know, militarism is much more complex, right? We have militarizing, militaristic, something's pacifistic. We talk about a country normalizing or abnormal. So there's this kind of language that tells us there's not one kind. Um, and then also we look at the roles of the military is much more complex now. They don't just fight wars, they do security, but they also do policing and state building and diplomacy, right? So if you look at what the military is, it's, it can't just be more or less, right? It, that, that doesn't tell us much. Uh, it's, it's more about type and how the military is used. And I think we can learn a lot from Japan in this case, where in a world that is becoming increasingly devastated by environmental catastrophe, what is the best allocation of our military resources in order to save human lives? And I think Japan, because of its particular vulnerability, its physical environment has influenced the software and its thinking on the military. I'll skip this one for now. So let's take a look at demographics, right? So here's Japan's, I think, the biggest problem. And uh, I'm excited uh, to, uh, Andrew Oros right now, he's currently working on a book on aging in all of East Asia. So that's like the next project that I think will really contribute to what we're trying to look at and how demographics can affect security. And so Japan, we're seeing a steady decline in population size. If you look at the demographics crisis, here's in 2015, here's 2020, here's 2030. And then here's 2050, right? This has significant impacts, right? Look at this, the, it's, you want a healthy pyramid that's shaped like a pyramid, uh, like this for your population. Japan's more shaped like an urn, right? Where you have a very small young population to join the military, pay the taxes to support uh, the elderly population, these physical constraints that make it very difficult to change the military orientation because of this physical constraint. 
So when people ask, what is Japan going to do? Japan should militarize because of a rising China and nuclear North Korea. The answer is like, sure. Okay, go do it. Well, well, how do you do it when you can't tax the population that much anymore? How do you do it when you don't have the young people to join the military? How do you do it when nobody's really joined the military for 75 years and convinced them to do so, right? How do you do it if you have to buy your weapons from the United States at twice the cost of making it yourselves? How do you build your own weapons when if you're a hotshot student from TIU and, and you're graduating, no one here is telling you to join the military industrial complex, right? You're, you're getting a job at like Deloitte or you're, you're working in a different thing. You don't have the culture here that promotes that kind of activity as you do say in other countries. Uh, so if we look at these poor demographics, it, it's quite startling. Uh, the, the, the annual bursts in 2016 dropped to under 1 million. Uh, is 840,000 in 2020. So if you, let's do the math, right? So if the self-defense force recruits around 11,000 soldiers per year, you would have to capture 1% of all births per year in order just to meet your replacement quota. That's actually kind of a lot because you have the regular economy where people want to join, right? Uh, so the, the, the population uh, crisis is quite problematic. And then you couple that with the aging population where Japan is doing everything that's right. You want your population to get old, right? Because that means your, your safety net is good. People are healthy. And yet the elderly population becomes an economic liability uh, in terms of your, your spending behavior, right? So this physical conditions make it very hard to militarize in the traditional sense, as I argue. Uh, and so we take a look at some of the social reasons. Why is it the population uh, aging and declining? Well, the delayed marriages, uh, the average age of women getting married has increased uh, about almost four years in the last 30 years. Um, very few kids are born out of wedlock in Japan. Uh, so there's like these social issues that uh, prevent people from having uh, a lot of children. But the, the, there's, it's a vicious cycle, right? If the economy is stagnant, people have to delay having kids. And by delay having kids, you have fewer kids because the optimal window of opportunity of having kids is smaller for health reasons and cost reasons. So it becomes this problem where it's, it's an unvirtuous cycle. Uh, child rearing um, in um, Japan is quite expensive. Finding daycare centers in major cities uh, in Tokyo in particular is very difficult. Uh, there's a low birth rate um, in the country. And then I would argue like the work-life balance here uh, in many countries uh, is it's quite difficult. So it, again, another pressure to not increase uh, the amount of kids. And the, the way I look at it is if you look at what your, the Japanese government has tried to do to have, you know, uh, womenomics and all these things that have women have more her kids is that you can't really social engineer people having kids for the state, right? Like that's not a convincing argument, like population is declining, the economy is getting weak, so have more kids. That's not normally the impetus for most people having kids, right? And also I would argue is that women benefit the least from the state-oriented system, right? They get paid less in this, in this country and all countries, really. Uh, the rights are always less. So why would they take on the bigger burden of supporting a system that does not support them as much? So you have to really change the structural issues in order to address other structural issues. Uh, here's the low birth rate in Japan. It's just this uh, big decline. Uh, some you know, in, in, interesting data on the issues I talk about. If you look at the amount of women that quit after having uh, quit their jobs after having a child, it's, it, it's quite high on the, the right figure. I have some really interesting data on the amount of work that men and women do in the household once they have a kid. And I think like men in this country do like 30 minutes of work, like in childbearing compared to women that do like 12, 14 hours. So I forget the exact data off the top of my head. And, you know, guys like to exaggerate the amount of hours they put in on that already. So if they say 10, 10 30 minutes, it, it's probably two or three minutes, right? Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, about, and, uh, if you look at polling data also on like reasons why having a child would be difficult, this would be on the right side. Um, you look at the cost of child rearing for fathers and mothers, they, that's like why it's difficult. But if you look at the physical strain of raising children, women feel that more than men on the polling data, difficulty of balancing raising kids and work, women just really bear the cost of having children far more than men. And this has a huge effect on the GDP. Annual growth has been stagnant in Japan for a while. 
Um, and so what that means is that if you want to tax people to support the military in order to make up the population deficit, it's really hard to do so. Uh, so if we see this uh, bear uh, itself in the policy, so in some of my interviews with Japanese uh, uh, security experts and also politicians is they're, they're well aware of this problem with the population crisis and how it affects the security. So they came up with, and you know, they had a special uh, sessions to come up with a plan in the, in the research guidelines on how to improve the military. So they had this uh, Mujin, Shoujin, Rojin, Fujin kind of uh, play on words uh, on, uh, on how to improve the self-defense force. So they would invest in Mujin, which was like no people. So they're gonna do UAVs. They're gonna change its hardware. So you need less people uh, to do things. They're talking about bringing in more retirees back into the workforce, into the military, and then also increasing the amount of women uh, in the self-defense force. Uh, but it's really hard to do, right? Uh, and so they could try to make this up with like better technology. But if you look at the military industrial complex in Japan, uh, on the right side, Japanese companies, these are the top 100 defense manufacturers in, in, in the world. Japanese countries, uh, companies are not in there and they don't really generate much of their wealth from it. Right. Whereas in the West, uh, the United States, Europe, they generate, they have a lot of companies dedicated to making weapons. Right. But this is how it plays out. So I, I remember interviewing uh, a military uh, a soldier talking about uh, weapon development in Japan. And Japanese companies make fantastic hardware. Mitsubishi Heavy Industry makes fantastic tread on tanks. Um, it just doesn't break down. Uh, its operational capacity uh, uh, percentage is really high. But Japanese tanks don't see battle that often, right? So they're not battle tested. They don't get the data on how do you design a great weapon for combat. So it makes it very hard for them to sell to other countries, which would be illegal to begin with, but also to design a good weapon for warfare, right? You, you don't just turn it on. That's kind of the argument. There's a path dependence to 75 years of peace. Uh, so I'll move on to uh, this. Uh, so if you look at the self-defense force in Japan, it's around 251,000 or so uh, units. Um, uh, it, Japan's never been able to reach its quota, which is already pretty long, low for recruitment. Um, and so it, it's really hard for them to make up this demographic deficit. Uh, if you look at the normative uh, dimension two on the World Value Survey data on willingness to fight for your country, if you look at South Korea, China, Taiwan, it's in the 60s, 70s, and 80s of people willing to fight for the country to defend it. For Japan, it's 15% or so. It could be people don't wanna fight because they don't wanna endanger themselves, or it's just not in their daily lives where they think about it seriously. On Would I fight for the country? I don't know. We haven't fought a war in so long, right? Look at the United States. Uh, if you go to SeaWorld, which is like a Disneyland with whales, right? Before a show, on the microphone, they'll ask any veterans here, please stand up and everyone claps. If you're military in the United States, you get like a 10% discount on your auto insurance. It's so part of our daily life. Whereas in Japan, most people here probably don't know a person personally in the self-defense force. And definitely these people aren't walking around in their uniforms asking for discounts at stores, right? So it's just so separated from daily life. It's strange to say that the country is militarizing as something that, oh, China is rising. So let's, let's build up this military, okay, with who is kind of my first question, right? Uh, so if you look at the military force sizes, they're quite different in both in these countries. Uh, so let's take a look at how this works, right? So you have an aging and declining population, which I would argue leads to decreased savings and productivity. And that leads to decreased investments and less effective uh, and uh, more, less options for fiscal policies. You have less consumer spending and weakened economy, which means delayed marriages and births and fewer births. And that leads to the aging declining population. It's a very vicious cycle to get out of. So what you have in, the, uh, in terms of security is fewer recruits, less selective recruiting and early retirements for some folks. And then also when it comes to the weak economy, you have a limited defense budget. So you can't spend your way out of this problem. So you can see how the hardware has a very important effect on the, the software. So let's take a look at uh, peace culture, uh, the, the rules and rules part. Um, I'll spend about 10 minutes here and I think that that should be good enough time. So, you know, to start out with, look at the this critical and traumatic event for Japan with, um, you know, the, the, not only the, the devastation from the nuclear attacks and um, the, the conventional war against Japan, but also the lesson of being able to rebuild after such a, a devastating war and, and avoiding warfare. 
right? I would argue Japan and East Asia took very different lessons from World War II. For Japan, it was the militarists hijacked the country and led this country down this terrible path uh, of devastation. They, they wanted to avoid it, right? That some other countries have been critical of Japan for this narrative, saying it's a bit self-serving, but it has a functional, uh, uh, it, it functionally speaking, it prevents the country from really seriously considering militarism. In the rest of East Asia, it's because of their military weakness is why the Japanese were able to conquer and colonize. That's why you have conscription in other countries. Their weakness was why they suffered. Whereas in Japan, it's the strength is what drew on kind of uh, expansionist thinking, right? And I think that, that software is a critical component uh, in, in military policy. Um, and then I, I also argue in the book that even though some argue that as the war is further away from the original event, people might forget, right? That that's a possibility. But Japan is constantly reminded about its particular insecurity, right? After the 311 nuclear disaster and uh, you know the, the triple disaster, the anti-nuclear movement got reinvigorated in this country. And they tied it to the original discourse of the nuclear bomb in order to be anti-nuclear in its narrative. So there are always events. Anti-war attitudes didn't end in 1945 in Japan, right? Because there was the Vietnam War in the 70s that really reinvigorated anti-war attitudes. Also when Japan supported the war in Afghanistan, and then you look at um, the kind of debacle when it comes to uh, Japan's participation in, in the Middle East about five years ago on, on the, or Northern Africa five years ago and how that affected people's views. So there's always another event in the future that makes people question the need for militarism. Or you had the two journalists that was kidnapped and executed that really had the country really think about what kind of world do they want to get involved in. And so we look at the rules that Japan has codified. Uh, people normally focus on Article 9 in the Constitution. That's important. But also the Japanese Constitution is the oldest unamended Constitution in the world. Right? It has not changed since its inception. Um, and it's, uh, I would argue it's a, it's a thoroughly pacifistic in many ways, but anti-militaristic document, right? In the preamble, it talks about Japan's honored, uh, honored space, but really looking for the right to live in peace, right? So I would argue that this gave Japan a more broad um, view of security. You know, um, uh, on the way here, Professor Lamont and I were talking on the train about like, like uh, taking care of your, uh, the cost of living in this country, right? Uh, I've always argued that in Japan, uh, Luxuries are expensive, but necessities are cheap when compared to the United States, right? You, you, you try to get your health care first. There's a, a view of security that's much more broad than just state security. In Article 9, uh, Japan, you know, forgoes the right to have a, a standing military, which Japan clearly violates, right? So that's why I don't think Japan's pacifistic. It, it has a self-defense force, but it does operate in a way that limits how much Japan's willing to invest in the military. And even Japan's biggest critics in China or South Korea acknowledge Japan's right to self-defense. They use the kind of um, the, the UN's right to self-defense clause really to, to, uh, to supersede the Article 9. And Article uh, 25 talks about the promotion of this broader view of security, which I would say is like multi-pronged, right? So Japan can have a military. It, it is militaristic in a sense, but it's, very, it's used for very specific purposes. So the conventional narrative of Japan's pacifistic or not doesn't tell us much. We should kind of pay attention to, given the constraints of the anti-militaristic ecosystem, what is possible for the self-defense force and what does this mean for the US alliance and its relationship with Japan and Japan's relationship with the world. So if you look at the anti-militarism in its environment, you have the original nuclear weapons that really was kind of the center of it. Then you have anti-militarism um, activists. Um, then you have the, the argument of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons, and then you have the triple disaster. So you put this long history that, ha that has a, a power, I think, uh, for Japanese security. Uh, if you look at, um, you know, reasons why, this is like an NHK poll they did uh, years ago on, should there be a, an amendment to the, uh, like a, a, a constitutional change on um, uh, the, the constitution, um, people pointed to like, oh, actually Japanese are quite split on, on wanting to amend the constitution. 
Uh, but if you look at the reasons why, most of the reasons are to kind of make the self-defense forces role like clear. It's not so much like to challenge other countries actually, or it's to, um, it's really for balancing reasons. It's mostly for making sure the rights are clearly codified. Um, and reasons not to is like, they don't want to upset uh, other countries and, and things such as that. Uh, so one uh, last thing I'd like to talk about in, in um, this talk is I, I did a, a bunch of enlightening research where I, 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 my, my field work was mostly in Hiroshima and I traveled the country to um, peace museums around the country, right? And uh, Japan, uh, if you look at Japan, uh, I'm going to be very biased here. I'm, uh, it's very U.S. centric, but the size of Japan is about the size of California. And each prefecture is actually the size of a county. And, and, and so a county is just really an hour or two hour drive from one to another. And there's a peace museum in almost every single prefecture in Japan. And my students and I, we did some like GB, GPS work. And you're really at most a two hour train ride from any peace museum in the country, like from a peace museum from any spot in the country. So you might ask yourself like, is this really that important? They're just museums that not many people will go to. Well. We looked at the visitor data and some of them, they'll get a million, a million and a half visitors a year. Some of them only get 50 visitors a year. But peace museums and peace monuments are important physical expressions of what a society values. So in the United States, we get into big fights about Confederate statues, right? If you go to authoritarian states or communist states, Drive around the roundabouts, you see statues of war heroes, or you, uh, you'll see paintings and murals of like war history, because it's a constant physical reminder of what the value, uh, uh, what values the country has and who has power. So I think that many of these peace museums are expressions of what countries think about. So for Japan has more peace museums than anywhere else, and they have some war museums, but in the United States, we have primarily war history museums and not really any peace museums. And many of these peace museums are in important locations. In Hiroshima, obviously, it's in it's in uh, right connects right to Hondori, right to the main artery of the city, where it's a very expensive piece of real estate. Where and also it becomes a place of tourism where people are intending to visit uh, as part of their big trip, right? So in the United States, you'll go to what Disneyland or something like that or you'll go to the Statue of Liberty because that represents American values right so if you're uh visiting Japan people will go uh Kyoto is normally like pretty high in the list but the Hiroshima Peace Museum is always first or second as the most visited uh tourist spots for uh, for outsiders right so it shows that this is a signal that the country can send um so here's like all the, all the peace museums in Japan it's, it's quite a bit and there's some of the visitor data that we can see um, here are some examples of uh, some of the field work I did where you could see um, these activists in Hiroshima, you know, educating the public on these issues. Um, there's some private public uh, activities. So for instance, the Hiroshima carp, they have something called the Peace Nighter, which is this game uh, during uh, the week uh, uh, of the first week of August where they commemorate, you know, um, the, the event. And there's, uh, it's part of the discourse, right? Of how people express themselves. Um, if we look at the, and this is where we can look at how physical landscapes can also affect how ideas um, are done. So I, I, when I went to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I looked at how the physical landscape actually affected how peace discourse evolves. So Hiroshima is definitely the dominant message when it comes to Japan's peace discourse, right? But it's physical orientation matters. So I, I, one, one reason I would argue why Hiroshima is such more known than Japan is that it's closer to Tokyo. There's a, a, there's a Shinkansen line that goes to Hiroshima. So if you're a tourist or if you're someone living in Tokyo, you're more likely to go there because it's cheaper and easier. And Nagasaki is further off, right? So it's just more work to, to, to get their narrative. Uh, I know that line is going to be completed in a couple of years, and I'm curious on how that will change. Uh, Nagasaki tends to have a much more critical view of the government when it comes to its nuclear and military policies. Also, Hiroshima is a very flat city, and most of the activity happens at city center, right? Even Hiroshima train station is, uh, is not as active as downtown, 
and it's very flat, so it's very walkable. So when people go to work, they have to go through the park or uh, if you're in that area. And so you can hold big demonstrations in that place. And so you could gain a lot of critical mass for your message. Nagasaki has a couple major places in that city where people visit. And so the, the, there's no true city center. And it's a much more hilly city. And Peace Park itself is like three different levels. There's the museum at the top level and then the park that's at a lower level. And then you have the statue at a different level. So there's no natural place for you to hold your demonstrations or have a lot of people in one place. So this is where I argue the physical environment actually shapes how ideas can, can evolve over time. Um, and this is like a map of uh, Nagasaki. Uh, uh, related to these peace museums, if we look at visitors, this is the Hiroshima Peace Museum. You can see uh, increases in uh, overall visitors, but there's actually a big, a big increase in foreigners visiting Hiroshima. So this is where its accessibility makes that city's peace message travel further than Nagasaki's. Uh, and if you look at the student population, which is I, I'm very interested in for Japan, it stayed um, pretty consistent but it plays out in a unique way. So if you look at the amount of students that visit Japan, it's been decreasing to, uh, I mean, the students in Japan that visit peace museums, it decreases, right? If you overlay that with population decline, it maps on almost perfectly. The amount of young kids that go to Japan is decreasing based on how many young kids exist in the country. It's been decreasing, right? Um, However, there's a big difference between high school students, middle school students, and uh, elementary school students on who's visiting these museums. Elementary school students have stayed stable, whereas high school student visits to the Peace Museums has declined. And you're like, okay, why is this the case? Well, uh, I looked into the data and high school students, their amount of travel for their school trips has increased internationally as the price of international travel has decreased. Right? So like it's cheaper to go to Korea, Singapore, or something like that. And you're more likely to send your high school kid abroad for their school trip than your fifth grader, right? And so it, it maps on quite well. And then you look at um, where are these students traveling from? The majority of students that travel, high school students that travel to Hiroshima Peace Museum come from the Tokyo area or further away. So, cause they're older students. So they're, they're able to travel further or easier. Parents are more willing to do so. So if you look at the visitor data and population decline, it maps quite well. So if you, you work out the math, it's very likely that every student in Japan at one point in their primary education life has visited a peace museum uh, in their life. So it's part, I would argue, it's very, very uh, important part of their education experience. Um, you look at uh, school trips in uh, the country, um, again, the elementary school kids stayed consistent, um, uh, whereas the others have shifted. And here's another important point too. If the school trips have actually stayed consistent or increased, but the population has declined, that means each group is smaller, right? So that means when they're going on these tours at these peace museums, it's a much more intimate experience because there's fewer students. If you have a lecture with a hibaksha, and there's 10 students, you can talk to them more than if there's 30 students. So here again, you can see how the physical demographics affects how the ideas spread. Um, these are the annual school trips in a different presentation. Um, so my conclusions are um, on, the, on the peace movement is that there are new actors that enter the peace movement, that's a concern, but there's always something that generates interest. Now it's big things on environmental concerns on why people care about the peace movement. Uh, but the weakness of the Japanese peace movement is that it's very hierarchical and underpaid. So a lot of people quit uh, working at NGOs because they, they don't get paid enough. Um, there's new motivations over time, uh, but there's still like a strong network of, of peace activists that, that still exist. Um, and so there's a, uh, there's a new context plus embedded power, right? So your, your physical environment exists, it changes a little bit over time, um, but it won't change completely. So what I argue is peace culture in Japan is pervasive and enduring, but it's not hegemonic. So when people counter my argument, they say, well, if Japan's purely pacifistic and it's not militarizing, then why did they uh, convert a destroyer to be a sem semi-carrier? Well, because peace culture is not the only game in town. There are competing rules and everyone's fighting for these rules on what to dictate which country 
the, what direction the country will go to. But uh, these are serious players. Uh, just because the communists lost a lot of their seats in the 1960s and 70s doesn't mean you know, peace culture doesn't exist anymore. It evolved, just like how the security context evolved. Um, and you put it together with the very uh, difficulty of growing the military force in terms of spending and recruitment, then you have a context or an ecosystem that limits Japanese security, uh, uh, militarism in the conventional aggressive sense uh, in very uh, significant ways. Uh, so that's my talk for today. Thank you everyone for sticking with me for the 40 minutes or so, and I, I'd be happy to take questions uh, from, from you all. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Lee, for your presentation. Um, what we will do now is uh, I would make some comments as a commentator or the discussant. And then um, after that, I open the floor for a Q&A from the physical audience and from the virtual audience. Um, so um, I find, first of all, I find this, uh, I read this book and um, I find the book very informative uh, and, uh, you know, it challenges um, the conventional wisdom in the way that um, some of the leading scholars on Japan's security policy have concluded that Japan is militarizing, Japan is becoming a normal country. Uh, but I think you challenge those and saying that, uh, you know, those um, um, anti-militarism uh, norms, rules uh, have influenced the Japanese uh, security policy. And uh, it's maybe too early to, to say that uh, Japan is indeed has become a normal state. Um, so your main question is why Japan is reluctant to increase its military commitment or why Japan is reluctant to become a normal country. And I think, you know, you did a great job by saying, you know, there are many factors, international, domestic, material, and ideational. And uh, I think you provide a balanced view of, it's not just a structure versus you know, domestic, or it's, just, it's not just a, a, a ideational versus material, but all these factors are important. And I think you did a great job in providing evidence why material and ideational factors are important. But I think still your main emphasis is on the norm of anti-militarism in Japan. And because these anti-militarist norms are very strong, robust, um, that would place a constraint or restraint on Japan becoming a more normal uh, country. Um, as I said, I think it challenges the conventional wisdom about uh, Japan's defense policy. Many people are saying that Japan has become, you know, normalized, uh, a normal country. Uh, but I think you uh, sort of uh, make a point that uh, because of this strong anti-militarist uh, norm, it may be too early uh, to, to say that old habits die hard. Uh, you also provide new insights about Japan's aging population, population decline and aging society, how those uh, factors played a key role in determining or shaping a Japanese defense policy. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you provide a very balanced uh, 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 analysis uh, perspective. Uh, I found the book well-researched and well-written. And, uh, uh, you know, I really would like to congratulate you for producing such a fine piece of work uh, out of uh, your dissertation. It's always, you know, an honor for many graduate students to publish their dissertation, and I think this is one model. Uh, and I really, uh, you know, enjoyed reading your book. 
All right, having said that, I would like to raise some points uh, which came to my mind as a question slash uh, comment. Number one is about your research question. You start with the premise that Japan is an abnormal nation. Japan is not a normal nation in terms of military uh, power or military commitment. But I wonder what would a normal nation, what would normal nations defense forces would look like? Are there any criteria? For example, should normal country possess nuclear weapons? Or should a normal country have a larger defense spending than uh, Japan is currently spending? Unless you show a criteria for normal country, I think, um, you know, it's hard to, for us to evaluate uh, the, uh, you know, uh, the statement or the argument that you made. Um, because I think some people would argue Japan is a completely normal country. Uh, why should Japan have larger military power or nuclear weapons if Japan is protected by the American nuclear umbrella? Um, it shouldn't that be perfectly normal, rational? Uh, so, uh, you know, once again, I think you, you still need to provide some criteria by which we can determine this is the normal state should look like, and this is what the abnormal state should look like, and Japan should fit to this abnormal uh, type. Um, so that's number one uh, question. Number two, I mostly agree with your argument about the role of uh, norm or rules uh, on Japan's defense policy, but there may be some ambiguity in your argument. At one point you said anti-militarist norms uh, are reified through time and experience and uh, recurrent practices, and therefore they remain resilient and influential. I think you have a quote in this, pan uh, in this slide somewhere. But at the same time, you mentioned security policies are not entirely shaped by anti-militarist uh, norms. So the question is how much and to what degree should anti-militarist norms influence Japan's policy? <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, you have a very interesting uh, 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 sentence, and I liked it very much. You said, anti-militarism norms are pervasive, enduring, but not hegemonic. You know, what does that mean? You know, pervasive, enduring, but not hegemonic. Uh, maybe you, you want to say that uh, anti-militarist norms are not really deterministic, not really determining Japan's uh, defense policy 100%. If so, then once again, to what extent, under what conditions those norms are important? And under what conditions those norms may be breached or changed? In fact, I think... Some of the anti-militarism norms have been breached. For example, um, well, the three non-nuclear non principles, Japan should not possess, should not uh, produce, should not uh, introduce nuclear weapons. This principle, uh, at least one of which, the known introduction has been breached a uh, long time ago by Prime Minister Kishi and Prime Minister Sato when they allowed secretly for American ships with nuclear weapons to uh, come to Japan and, and, and you know, stop by the Japanese ports. Um, similarly, the limits on defense budget below 1% of GDP, this was breached during Nakasone era. Um, 
ban on non dispatch of self defense forces abroad. For a long time, the Japanese government, the conservative government, has interpreted Article 9 to mean that Japan should not send self defense forces overseas. But I think this was breached in Nakasone uh, era, uh, but also during the Koizumi administration during the Iraq war. Um, so there are examples like this, and also the ban on arms export has been breached. Um, I'm not really saying that those norms are insignificant, but because those norms and the principles have been breached in the past, I think you may want to discuss a bit more about why they were breached, what significance they have, under what conditions norms can be breached, and under what conditions norms can be maintained. Because, um, you know, you, you mentioned about the Japanese defense forces or Japanese national security policy is not something that the nationalists would want it to be to become you know more hawkish uh, you know uh, full-fledged uh, military force but if you subscribe to the anti-militarism idea then we would expect that japan would not have uh, the military forces at all article 9 prohibits japan from having army navy and air force any war potentials so if you interpret that strictly, Japan should not have self-defense forces at all. Why Japan has the self-defense forces? Um, so, you know, I think norms are there, but at the same time, uh, uh, there are many other factors working uh, to uh, undermine uh, the, the effectiveness of the, of the norm. Um, so maybe you want to be more specific about when and how the norms are important. Um, finally, I would like to point out that um, you may want to specify what Japan's defense policy should look like if your theory is correct. Uh, that is to say, we want to know the theoretical implications of your argument. Otherwise, any evidence we have or you provide could be used to support your argument. What evidence would falsify your argument? You know, um, we or you need to provide those theoretical implications that is to say, you know, if your theory is correct, then we, we should be seeing those uh, concrete evidence or concrete phenomena. Um, I emphasize this point because it's not only you, but also many of the Japan security specialists, their work um, have, I think, this kind of a program. Any evidence can equally support the realist argument, but also any evidence can equally support the constructivist argument. And um, it's hard to falsify um, the arguments that they're making. So um, I think this, um, you know, being more specific about how Japan should be behaving if your argument is correct, I think is very, very important uh, for a scholar uh, you know, to, um, uh, to do. Um, those are the comments I would like to make. And, um, but once again, uh, I think the book has a lot of information um, illuminating and I really enjoyed reading the book. Uh, so thank you very much. That's my comment. All right. Thank, thank you very much for um... The comments, because this is exactly why I wrote it. I I I I did try to write it in a 
I don't want to say controversial way, but uh, to get engaged and kind of, I, I don't want to pick fights, but more like, okay, I have a, I have a claim and I, I want to make sure I do a good job supporting. So this is really useful. Uh, so I, I'll respond to these uh, comments first. So on the first uh, question is, this is where maybe I could, could have done a, a better job or a bit more clear uh, with it is that uh, I don't argue that Japan is uh, abnormal or let me, let me start with this. If we look at realist theory or most international relations scholarship, it's very US centric, right? I mean, it, it, uh, uh, IR and, and, and political science, really the, 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 it's heavily centered in the United States where that's where the major conferences are, that's where the major colleges and programs are. So much of the data is drawn from there. So when we say normal, right? And when, uh, when uh, security analysts think, they're basing it basically on what the United States would do. And that's a flawed premise to begin with because the US is the most abnormal country when it comes to military spending. It's the most adventurous, it's the one that spends the most. So how do we build a model where the US is the normal? So you're absolutely right. Like is Japan normal? What is the baseline? And I argue actually there, there is no great working baseline because the theory is problematic to begin with, right? And so I would argue that Japan is this abnormal and non-normal language isn't so useful. So I look at like type, right? So Japan is, I would argue like, um, you know, low military spending type that, that will use its military for like disaster relief purposes or things such as that. It's, it's a human security oriented military, right? So there is no normal, abnormal, we have different types. So you have uh, expansionist militaries or you have uh, and, and things such as that. So I think I, I could do a much clearer job at so showing that there is no normal, but this is the problem with language that it, it's useful to be able to show changes in our dependent variable if we have a working baseline, but then if we don't have a great working baseline to begin with, it, it's difficult to do. Um, where, so should a normal country have nuclear weapons? Uh, my last chapter, I would argue that I, I, I push that Japan is showing a potential model that I think countries should copy. That you are, if you're gonna have a military, of course it's basic, responsibility is defense of the nation. It's, it's not security policy in a sense, if that's the case, but they have to be trained for disaster relief. Even the United States, when the US was fighting the Iraq war and Afghanistan war, we did a, a, an amazing job winning the war quickly in the conventional sense, but we had a very difficult time winning the hearts and minds of people because their soldiers weren't trained in different languages. They weren't uh, trained in like cultural awareness. They weren't trained in, in, in state building. The U.S. is great at training our soldiers to do what they used to do very well, which is killing the enemy. But what about after you do that, how do you convince them that you're going to build a school and protect the school there, right? So I think Japan, actually, this is where my theory predicts that given the limits on the Japanese self-defense force and the rules that it follows, Japan is providing a, a different model, right? Uh, in Vietnamese culture, um, and that's a very broad thing to say, uh, but my mother used to tell me that if an owl shows up at your household, it's kind of bad luck. It's kind of a shooting the messenger because when an owl shows up in front of your house, it means like something bad will happen. And uh, so you should get ready for it, right? Uh, so it's not really the owl's bad luck. It's supposed to be a good warning for you, right? Because it's telling you to get ready, but no one wants to see it because like, oh man, there's this bad luck coming. Japan is the owl for the international community. The population is declining. Right, it's been uh, the economy has been stagnant for 30 years. Right, environmental catastrophe hits Japan particularly hard because of its location. What's happening in Japan is going to happen to South Korea and China and other places around the world as their population declines. So, how Japan manages its security issues, I think, is a valuable lesson for other countries. So, I, I do, I do, I, you're right. There, the, the, there needs to be a baseline, but it's difficult. Right. So, when I use the word normal. I don't mean normal as in this is the baseline. I mean it in terms of a normative, when we say something is normal in a normative sense, it's right or wrong. And rules tell us that things are right or wrong. So for the Japanese politicians, if in my interviews, they've internalized a lot of this peace culture stuff. So when I talk about pervasive and enduring, but not hegemonic is, I'm interviewing a politician. I'm like, why don't you increase the budget by 2%? Like, just go get the votes. They'd be like, no, we can't do that. Like, it's, I'm like, what do you mean you can't? It's a political question. Of course you can. You just rally the votes. Says, yeah, it's not worth our time and energy. We got to go for 1.2, 1.3. So they've already internalized a lot of the norms that's already affected the conversation, how they debate it, but they're still interested in increasing the budget, right? So it's, it, it's, it's, it, the peace culture is there, 
but it doesn't say like you can't have a military, right? I argue that Japan's not really pacifistic, it's anti-militaristic. That the military is okay for some circumstances, whereas the pacifist would say, you never fight, right? A true pacifist would say, you can't do that. And I would say, Japan's uh, not the case. But when it comes to your question, which is important, which is like, okay, then how do we measure this? Or why, what leads to this specific outcome? This is where my answer leaves a lot of people unsatisfied is that that's kind of impossible to do to say, well, if China increases its defense spending by 25%, we should expect Japan to do it by this percent, or they should pass this policy. Even in realism, right? Walt said that neorealism is a security, is a, is a theory that needs a second image theory. It needs a supplementary theory to do so. And I could do a better job there where I could look at domestic politics and, and kind of map it out, but I'm more interested in the and, you know, I think this theory complements many others where if you want to go inside the box and you look at Samuels, but I'm looking at the rules and environment that shapes those debates, right? Because even like a, a neorealist argument, like, okay, China is increasing its um, defense spending. They can't tell us if Japan will get nuclear weapons or not, when, where, and how. They can't say, well, will it get five carriers or seven carriers? These are like impossible things to measure. So I don't even try to do that. In that way, and then I think a lot of people will not be, not be satisfied with that. But I'm a conventional constructivist. Where I'm like, that's not the questions I'm asking, and whatever. Like, you don't like it, <laughs> it just doesn't work. But I don't think it's possible. So I, that might not be satisfactory as an answer. But I just think that's a fight I can't win, or anyone can really do. Right. Um, your other question on what conditions can norms be breached is a fantastic question because, like. I try to do this in the book where I talk about like strong, medium and, and, and light norms. Um, but then you're right, then you could just kind of cherry pick, right? So I do give specific examples. If there's an invasion of the Japanese mainland, like a true like a, a attack, I would think a lot of these norms would like weaken pretty quickly. Like if they're existential threats, right? When it comes to uh, abandonment of the US alliance, uh, that would be quite a shock to you. So this would go to your original argument that you need the, these peaceful conditions. However, what I do to keep that in check is sure, even if half my story isn't true, which is the normative story, right? The physical things don't change, right? It doesn't matter if the norms are weak, if your population is declining, if you can't spend the money on the military, if 75 years of norms have given you a very weak military industrial complex. So those two things play together, which explains the limited uh, thing. So I think the book does a better job at explaining what can't be done than exactly what will happen. And I try to do that in the final chapter by talking about where uh, uh, Japan's um, policy under Abe and what direction that it's headed. Right? Um, and then when it comes to the, the breaches that you, you speak of, these are very enlightening. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up those examples. So these are major, right? This is where people could say like, you're kind of wrong. I mean. Trust me, when I was writing this book under the Abe administration, I was reading the newspaper every day. I'm like, oh my gosh, is he going to destroy my book, right? He's going to try to do this and do this and do this. And I was like, oh, okay, what did he do? And I survived his administration, I believe. Uh, this is not a criticism of him. This is saying his policies would go against my, my prediction. Well, if you look at the breaches of the norms, first is the non-nuclear principles, right? It was done in secret, right? That shows that the norms, the rules had an impact on the politicians in which they wanted to do this, but why do it in secret when if it's like a generally accepted kind of thing, you would just do it, right? So again, it's pervasive and enduring. Politicians internalize it, but they have their interest too, and they want to try to pursue that policy. So it's, it's limited. So it explains why, I can't tell you why Japan doesn't spend, you know, a hundred billion, and I can't tell you why it's spending 10, but I can tell you why it's having trouble going in one direction as opposed to the other because of these, these limits, right? Um, when it comes to the limits on the defense budget, it's right. It, Japan has breached it a couple times, actually, the 1% uh, budget. And actually, they do sneaky things, too, uh, where they, they, they increase the budget of the, 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 the Coast Guard. And if you put that together, they spend more. Or if you look at host nation support then it goes over 1%, right? Or if you look at the supplementary budget that comes a couple months later, if they, they go over the 1%, right? Um, but why go through all these accounting tricks to make it look like it's 1%? Because it has some kind of normative constraint, whereas you could say, there's a threat, let's spend more. And why even do 1% anyway? It's not even a law, right? 
it's tied to the size of the economy. So if we're saying it's security policy, then you spend it based on how many ships you need. Instead, Japan does it in reverse where we could kind of spend 1%, maybe 1.1, and then we'll figure out how we're gonna divvy it up. And the key part is once they divvy it up is you can't just go buy a hundred new carriers. You have to pay for really good retirement benefits or something to try to recruit people. So you gotta find ways to coerce people to join the military. So the, the physical constraint still affects how the money is being spent. So that's what I'm really interested in, that, that story uh, with that. Um, the, the sending the, the, the um, self-defense uh, forces abroad, that's a major thing. Uh, but most of the time is for disaster relief and, and, and things such as that. And when they do send it for other purposes, they try to come up with special rules to support the special defense force. Like they can't go in combat zones or... If they break those rules, they try a very hard time trying to hide that from the public, right? So like you can see how the norms do limit them, but they can still be broken. Like we do have laws against murder, but people still can commit it. But that doesn't mean we live in a society where murder is something we can just do, right? That's how norms kind of work in many ways. Um, and the arms export ban, that's a great one. And that thing was something that was I was paying attention to. Um, but again, because Japan has had trouble developing its defense industry. You know, it didn't get the submarine contract with, uh, with uh, Australia, I believe, and it went to France. Um, on that one, it's because they haven't had years of negotiation strategies, right? Like they, they, the, the military industrial complex is really behind. So I think you're right, there are breaches and I, I should do a better job or more time spending the counterfactuals. Like if this happens, how would I be proven wrong? I think that's classically great social science. And, you know, I, I think Jennifer Lynn does that wonderfully, actually, in her books. Uh, and I, that will be something I aspire to. But I was kind of really focusing on rechanging the way we talk about security. And then hopefully from these discussions, we can talk about the counterfactuals. Um, and so, uh, you know, on the Constitution thing, I think that's the last question, because I addressed the, where Japan's headed towards in the future. Um, you're right, uh, Japan does violate its Constitution. And I mentioned that earlier, and that you know, Japan's not a pacifistic country. It's actually a militaristic country. It's just not at, in the same way that the United States is or France is or things like that. So the next project that I'm working after this that's related to this book is looking at interesting types of militarism. So you look at Irish neutrality or Swedish neutrality, or you look at Turkish militarism where the military can like, they'll, they'll throw a coup to take over the state when the military thinks it's needed to protect the government. Or you look at different types of orientations in the military that looks nothing like the United States or other countries, and Japan is another type. So I think that's where um, it, that would be the natural extension of this project to look at, okay, Japan actually has this military, but how does it justify it? Well, it justifies it because, you know, Japan uses the self-defense force to build relations with Southeast Asia when it comes to disaster relief, right? So it's on one hand humanitarian, on one hand security wise, and these things kind of mix quite a bit. And, and that's what I, I try to do with the book, which is to complicate the story, which is China did this, North Korea did this, so Japan has to go this way. Even if that were true, I don't know if Japan can do it easily uh, for the reasons that I point to. I, I hope that addresses some of the questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's op uh, open the floor for free Q and A. If you have any questions, um, if not, uh, let's look at the virtual audience and if they come up with some questions. Yeah, introduce yourself, who you are. Yes. Okay, so uh, does it mean the, it's planning to 
modify this position? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's the big question, right? If, if you're trying to modify the constitution to, um, to really significantly expand its military, um, it's value that would blow up my book. Right. Uh, I would argue not exactly because, again, I would already say Japan's not fully pacifistic. It would have to kind of come up with a justification, but it would show that the norms are much weaker than we think. Right. I think if Japan acquired nuclear weapons, that would be a major blow as opposed to trying to spend more on the military or recruit, because I just think they can't do that. Like they, they could afford some nuclear weapons, but I don't think they could get 10% of the population to join the military. Like that, that's, I, I just, I, I don't, I can't imagine that scenario. That'd be really hard. Um, but I don't think the constitution has a great chance of being amended because it requires um, both houses of the diet to approve it at two thirds. And then it goes up to a national referendum where it require 50% plus one person to do it. So that's a high, tall order to ask. And this is where going into the domestic politics story is really useful, right? This is where we can look at coalition politics and Komeito's influence on the LDP and how they've influenced what options that the LDP has when it comes to these changes, right? And so I think, you know, you know, Dick Samuels does really great work of looking at domestic politics that explains a lot of that. And, you know, I, I do that at a cursory level, looking at the norms that inform Komeito, and I have some information on that, but mine was more focusing on the peace groups and the, the general atmosphere uh, of the country. Uh, but I would think that's the case. So. I don't think they'll be um, changing the constitution. And when you use the term militarizing, you know, I, I'm not quite sure they're, they, they are militarizing, but I don't know if it's like a, it's not more or less, it's, it, it's in a different kind of way. Thank you for your question. You want to read the question? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Christopher Lim. I'm currently uh, undergraduate student here. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to agree with you that Japan is trying to invent a new type of well, militarist expanding that is kind of different from the United States and their allies. Uh, because like, one of the things that we learned from Japanese popular culture is that uh, there is a recent survey in amongst the circles of uh, Japanese self defense force. And, about like, how they how they see themselves against like the murders of other people, other nations in the world. Like, uh, is them being limited deployment being uh, affecting their view of like what are the purposes of the military? And it does show that a lot of the members of the self defense force see themselves as not as soldiers but as like uh, social workers in that they aid in humanitarians and everything. And um, my question to you is that. Uh, seeing from an earlier uh, global dialogue event, we established that the, what China is doing in the region is simply diplomatic signaling towards uh, the West, and perhaps one of them is Japan, and that China doesn't really have the ambition or uh, capabilities to overtake the United States as a global superpower. And uh, if that's the case, then why should Japan continue with their uh, military expansion and like further capabilities development. And especially since we also see uh, the social problems in uh, that happens in Japan also happening in China and <clears throat> perhaps to some extent in North Korea as well. And will China still, since the, the Chinese capability is declining and they don't really have this ambition of overtaking anyone in the region, then the questions remain like, why is Japan, well, why should they do this? Thank you yes. very much. Thank you. So your question is kind of like, can you then notice that if there, there's lots of reasons for them to do it, and then there's reasons not why not to, right? Um, yeah. Um, I'm not an uh, uh, expert. I, I don't know. It sounds so silly saying I'm a Japan one. But uh, so um, you know, take this with a grain of salt, right? Um, at the very least, I would argue that we're in Japan's not pacifistic, right? Being a pacifist is really hard. That means if someone were like, th this is a question, um, this is a, a question uh, I ask my students when we talk about deterrence theory, like nuclear deterrence. And it's a rational based theory, right? That if a country were to, why do you have nuclear weapons? Because if another country were to attack you with their nuclear weapons, what's the rational thing to do? And everyone will always say, of course, attack them back. 
But you know, my Pat Morgan, my advisor back in grad school, says like that's not a rational, that's not rational at all. That's just rage and revenge, right? The rational thing would actually to sue for peace, that you would actually give up your state and be like, look, I, we don't want millions of people to die. We don't want to kill millions of yours. We just like find a way to end this conflict and we figure out the end game. That's a hard thing to do, though, right? It's actually we're tied to our territory and we want to protect it. So even if China was like peaceful. And didn't have these grand ambitions. It's very hard to convince any state to be like, okay, let's take their word for it. You always need a security guarantee, rational or not. It's because like the alternative of losing your state is like too much to bear, right? So Japan's never going to not have a military because that's a risk, right? Now, when it comes to the credibility of Chinese aggression, right? This is where it's really hard to analyze Japanese security because it's so tethered to U.S. security, right? We don't have the counterfactual, and if they're completely separate on what the Japanese would do. So I would say that you know the problem with China, why it's such a threat, even if it's was like positive signals, G goes to Japan and high fives Kishida, and everything's like looks good. China's still over a billion people strong. Its military is like ten times the size. Its sheer scale makes it significant, right? So even if it doesn't grow more, its military grows just from its pure size. So it and like. In terms of raw power, it can be seen as a threat. And then you look at some of the more aggressive rhetoric they use, or you know, uh, its claims on uh, islands and things like that that the Japanese claim, or the Philippines claim, or the Vietnamese claim, like that. That that's not enough of a positive signal from the Chinese to say, look, we're trading with everybody, we're building all these things. It must be we're good. Yeah, but you know, the area is so small. The problem, with, the reason why there's so many, you know, uh, disputes is that. There's overlapping claims just purely on proximity, right? So no country is willing to accept that. And one other thing I, I, I would argue is that we always say that we live in a post-colonial world because colonialism has ended. There's no such thing as post-colonial. Colonialism always exists, right?、Uh, the post-war period always exists. Japan will always be a country that deals with the ramifications of World War II. China is a country that deals with that because that colonialistic history is embedded in all their histories. Right, so no matter what the Chinese claim today, doesn't change what happened in the past, and that's part of their histories and identity, right? So that's something that you can't just unwind with different policies. So states are going to behave in a certain way, in a distrustful way. That's not just purely power balancing, which is a part of it. But at the same time, you know, they do want to build institutions and do all the liberal things to try to create peace. So it's always a kind of a balance between the two. So I would argue that, yeah, sure, Japan does have reasons to go super militaristic. But it's a hard case to make where you could say like, all right, get rid of all your weapons and just hope for the best. Because if you're wrong, then then you're wrong spectacularly. And then also, if Japan completely demilitarized and had nothing but fully fully pacifistic, then it'd be a hard thing to convince the the Americans to stay. Right? Here's the big contradiction. It's not really violation of Article Nine. That's a contradiction for Japanese pacifism. It's that it's the U.S. Japan alliance. Right, it's American soldiers that are putting their lives on the line whenever there's like a conflict with Japan. That's why they had to modify the U.S.-Japan guidelines and collective self-defense. Japan doesn't have its nuclear weapons, but it's under a nuclear umbrella. Japan signed the Australia statement plus the New Zealand statement when it comes to anti-nuclear things. There's a contradiction in Japanese politics when it comes to that because they're fighting rules in this country. There are some that really want some set of rules, and some want a different set. And you're always fighting for those rules, and rules give you privileges, right? So if you can get your rules to be dominant, then you get all the benefits from it. In basketball, the court is ten feet tall. If we raise that to fifteen feet, then the players that are seven foot tall will be much much better than the ones that are six feet. Rules give you benefits. So in Japan, for those that want to support a stronger military, they don't do it just out of belief. They also get benefits from it, right? So. Uh, it's a constant struggle for these things.、Uh, anyone want to read that question, or where is it?、Uh, the next, yeah, we're running a little bit you know, close to time, but we do have、yeah. a question from a graduate student in the Q and A box.、Yeah. It is:、uh, Do you think the rise of China and North Korea will push Japan to go nuclear in the future? Because you kind of hinted that it did not. Yeah, that's a tricky one, right? So if they do it, I think it would be secret first, <laughs> because.、Uh, but right, that one's tricky, right? I'm gonna say no, right? So for everyone watching, if you wanna, I, I should not be the standard for which 
if, uh, to give good career advice when it comes to successful scholarship. But if you swing hard, you're going to be attacked by everyone or people will think you're absolutely right and they're going to set you either way, <laughs> right? And I'm going to just put my foot down and say, no, I don't think Japan's going to get nuclear weapons because I think that's such a, that's, um, that'd be beyond the pale. You know, that'd be such a, a threshold to cross as the only country to be attacked by nuclear weapons on a human population to, for them to get nuclear weapons. I mean, that, that's the kind of interesting question, uh, Professor Miyash, that which is, this was the fastest solution to Japan's security problems. Get your nuclear weapons. They could have done that so long ago. So everyone that claims that Japan's militarizing, why do all this fancy dancing stuff about military spending, 2%, whatever, if you want a shortcut to absolute security in the conventional sense, get your nuclear weapons. And yet they haven't done it for so long. So something's going on there, right? Um, North Korea got nuclear weapons, right? And we know when countries get nuclear weapons, countries don't invade you anymore, right? If, uh, would the Ukraine crisis go on exactly as it did if they kept their nuclear weapons? I'm not advocating for it, but there's clearly enough evidence to convince politicians that this is a good idea. And yet they still struggle with, can we get to 1.2%? How about 1.1? Forget 2%. And they're still debating that instead of getting nuclear weapons, right? Or can we refuel ships in the Middle East? Is that okay? Is that a violation? Like the public, is that, is that okay or not? Instead of like, yeah, let's, let's get nuclear weapons and see what people think, right? And also like, what would China and South Korea do if Japan got nuclear weapons? I've spoken with South Korean politicians. They would get them so fast if Japan got them, right? Uh, a more interesting question is, um, not North Korea getting nuclear weapons, but what if South Korea got nuclear weapons, what would Japan would do? Then they'd be the odd man out, right? That'd be really interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I still don't think uh, that would be the case. Um, you know, yeah. it's interesting question. And I think uh, nuclear North Korea, the rise of China certainly um, is a factor, uh, maybe inducing Japan to become a nuclear a country. But I think they are not the nest. They may be necessary condition, but they're not sufficient condition. Mm -hmm. I think the sufficient condition is whether the U.S. will say bye bye to Japan. We are not going to provide any more nuclear umbrella. I think when that happens, that is to say, when the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance is break is broken, I think Japan would have to seriously start thinking about whether she will have a nuclear weapons or not. Uh, but um, the likelihood of the U.S. leaving Japan is not so great. So um, right now, I don't think that's a possibility. Even if we see North uh, Korea having, you know, a, a lot of nuclear weapons, China becoming more threat. Um, so that's how I feel about, you know, Japan's nuclear uh, policy. Can I add a little bit to that? Do I have time? Yeah. So like, this is where the counterfactuals are really good social science where we could try to map it out. I, I could spend more time on that, right? But then there's like an infinite amount of things we could start mapping out, right? So um, if the US alliance were to collapse, right? Now we're having a, a whole new research agenda and discussion on like, what's the likelihood of that before we get to the militarization part. That's like another step, right? And there's a lot of reasons why the, that wouldn't happen. There's, these, there's vested interest in these bases economies are dependent on them. The two countries are very strong allies. Uh, the US wants to be in East Asia so they could contain China. But at the same time, I would say nothing impossible, right? Uh, nobody thought the US was gonna leave the Philippines and it, it became a thing, and, right? And But here's another thing, as a Vietnamese person, this is very interesting to me. No one ever thought that the United States would be reinvited to go back to Vietnam. Right, like if that was the ugliest war for uh, you know, Vietnamese American for me in many ways. And then up until the 70s, uh, until the 90s, they weren't even communicating. And now they're getting really close because of China. So real tangible interests can matter. And the, the Vietnamese are considering the re security relationship with the United States. That would be unheard of uh, just two, 20 years, 30 years ago, right? So things can shift. So of course, there's all these possibilities that could weaken the norms. Then we get into my second half on the demographics part, which I don't think change so easily. Um, but when it comes to Japan's free hand and IR, I have a small argument in the, the book on this, which is Japan is really a blessed country in the sense that it's pretty well liked internationally, right? It, it, Japan's mostly disliked in East Asia compared to other places of the world, but in the Mideast, Japan has a pretty free hand, 
in South America and at, like other places around the world, because Japan's really known for ODA, uh, disaster relief, not selling weapons, really a, generally a peaceful country. And it gains economic and diplomatic benefits from this. If Japan really starts to be more militaristic, and I, I've spoken to Japanese politicians on this, they're really aware that its identity as a peace-loving country helps it in so much of its interactions around the world. So if they were to get nuclear weapons, I mean, how do you host international conferences that are anti-nuclear anymore, right? How do you get all these like cultural diplomatic benefits? So they would be giving up something. Nothing comes free. Politics is just like physics, right? And there, that there are trade-offs for everything. And then that, that would be a high cost that Japan would have to pay if it follows that route, which I would argue is not impossible because nothing's impossible in our work, but I say it's highly unlikely uh, in the book. Any other questions or what? Oh, sorry, uh, Professor. Can we? So we have one. Uh, yes. I'm running out of battery. Yeah. I'm running a little bit out of time. But... No, my battery is like five percent. So, hopefully. Professor Memo, can you get any more? Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, well, um, I have a question. Well, actually, I actually have a lot of questions, but I know that we're running out of time. Um, and I must, I must confess that I'm really confused um, from the presentation and then the explanations after that. Uh, and my reaction to the presentation was very similar to uh, Dean Akitoshi's uh, remarks, uh, where there are serious concerns about uh, arguments, about the possibility of the arguments, as well as this ontological kind of back and forth between realism and constructivism. Uh, it, seems that, it seems that we're having a hard time making up our minds in terms of what is it? Is it norms or is it structure? Now, in the ideal world, we could have both ways, uh, but I'm not quite sure that's how it works. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for, I guess, an answer or clarification on that, on whether you think it is normative kind of uh, or normative constraints that play a bigger role here than actually structural ones. And you cannot have both. So you can't say, well, it's the, you know, the, the, the structural physical kind of constraints on, on Japan, but then also there is a normative spread of ideas. Uh, so if you have to pick one, uh, which one are you going to have? Uh, the other question that I have is with regards to the issue of possibility that, uh, that Dina Kitoshi mentioned. I'll mention one example. Uh, you talked about the issue of children, uh, and you were saying, well, here's another example of how the demographic crunch, in a way, affects uh, positively the spread of pacifism. And you point to the fact that, you know, the, the smaller the cohort of students going to these museums, then the more intimate the experience, and therefore the more lasting also the impact. But you could make the opposite argument, which I'm sure you would make in the opposite case. That is, the bigger the cohort, the bigger the group of people participating, then the greater the mass of students being, in a way, uh, um, taught and being uh, spread these ideas, and therefore the deeper, in a way, the impact of this pacifist uh, uh, rhetoric. So I guess the concern that I have and what I heard throughout the presentation, and this became also evident in your comments, is that there, there is there doesn't seem to be a commitment uh, to a particular, and maybe that's a strength or not, to a particular theoretical framework. You seem to just also have some realist kind of arguments, structural arguments, but then you also have some constructivist and normative uh, ones. Uh, one final example of that is you're pointing out when you're answering the issue of the impact of nuclear weapons, and you made the ultimate realist argument, which is, well, you know, we know that where there are nuclear weapons, nobody gets attacked. Uh, this is the Waltzian right, proposal, let's give everybody nuclear weapons, and then we don't have war. So I guess all of this is a reflection of my confusion a little bit about what is the central claim of your argument here. I'm sorry for the lengthy comment. Yeah, uh, thank you for your questions. Um, so uh, I would respectfully push back on the first one on making me choose between the ideational <laughs> and structural. Like those, th those things are actually intimately intertwined. For instance, um, 
the if your population is declining and you can't recruit people for the military, you have less of a physical presence of the military and society, which makes it more likely that you don't propagate like militaristic discourse and norms around society. And then that kind of allows like the anti-militaristic discourse to not be challenged as much, right? That we argue sometimes that norms are the only game in town. Um, and so I, I do think those two things are intertwined. So for instance, anti-militaristic norms is why you don't have a strong military industrial complex, uh, which is like the weapons kind of story, right? That's a physical thing though. Like your weapons are a, a hardwired reality that exists. So I, I don't, those two things are, are, are uh, not one and the same, but the, they're uh, symbiotic or they're, they're interconnected. So, you know, a, a lot of uh, individuals might dislike that explanation. They think it's messy, but I, I, it's a messy argument. I, I don't have a causal A leads to B or structural is more important than uh, ideational or reverse because neither one can explain it completely. I think they're completely tied. And so I apologize if that, you know, it's not convincing or, uh, but that's where, uh, I, I, that's where I believe uh, it stands. Um, when it comes to uh, the size of the population of the kids, uh, uh, so that one, it's not as if there's like fewer kids and therefore if the group is smaller, that means like you don't have as many advocates of the, the piece and then they, they go around and spreading it. Remember, the overall population is declining too, right? So like it's in terms of raw numbers, it's all going down same percentage wise in terms of how many kids exist and how many kids are going. And so I'm not saying that these are peace advocates and you're having more kids go to the museum and therefore they're going to tell more people. It's just as part of the educational experience for many Japanese kids, they learn about war and history in a specific way that I would say is very difficult, different than in the United States or other places, right? Like we studied the Alamo as like some kind of like good story of like defense and the, when these guys are like what rebels or something, I forgot how the story goes. Whereas like here, you actually go to the museum and talk about, well, this is what are the consequences of, of war. Uh, I think a good example of how education and war is taught is uh, not just so much Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which obviously have an orientation, but go to the Yamato Museum in Kure, right? This is, I would say a conventional war museum, right? But I interviewed the director of the museum and I was like, how did you put this display together? What is your logic? And he, his argument was, this museum is supposed to teach us about technology run amok. That this is like the lesson is like when technology has like no morals to keep it under control, then it leads Japan to these terrible things, right? That's how they pitched it, uh, at least to me, right? And so you can see how these uh, museums can have the, the way the discourse is structured uh, can affect those that learn it. But I'm not saying that, um, you know, uh, if the group, uh, I, I disagree in that if the group was bigger, therefore it would, it would spread more. The point I was just trying to make was when th there's more time for Q&A for each student in a classroom, if it's like six students as opposed to 20, uh, and, and the, just kind of typical pedagogy for a classroom, the smaller, I would argue that's more intimate. But this was kind of an aside in, the, in this talk in the book, it wasn't the main argument. So I apologize if that took us to the side, but that was the kind of claim I was making. Uh, when it comes to the nuclear argument, you know, the argument is I'm taking a little bit of everything and I could be like cherry, uh, cherry picking, right? Uh, the, the argument I was making there was, I was trying to show the, the, the weakness in the realist argument that their claim is that deterrence would lead to uh, this kind of behavior and Japan hasn't followed it. And I was using Morgan's piece about, because ultimately it's an irrational theory. Uh, I don't think deterrence uh, really works um, uh, as they explain it. Uh, so I was just using that to show like the limits of the realist argument on why Japan doesn't have nuclear weapons. Uh, but uh, I don't like uh, this pureness of like pure body constructivists to say that uh, material uh, factors don't matter. I think that makes no sense. Remember, I go back to physical and ideas interact and they matter. So I, I could make a realist claim, but I'm, I don't want to give realists a monopoly on the use of force, right? Uh, I'm saying that militarism is actually much more complex and that constructivists can say force is legitimate too in some circumstances. And I think nuclear force is unacceptable in Japan today. And I think for a long time, but if Japan got nuclear weapons or not nuclear weapons, but if Japan has a military, I wouldn't just say like, oh, therefore the realists must have won. Like, yeah, constructivists can have weapons too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thank you. Uh, but like these, these, these questions are critical for me because they're the ones that get to the heart of like what kind of social science we're doing. And I think I'm doing something a little bit different. That's a little bit messy and untraditional, but 
I've been this, the reason why I wrote it was I was dissatisfied with these like very clear partitions between the theories that I think ultimately are kind of lacking. And the counter argument to me would be, well, you're cherry picking or it's not as causal. And uh, I've tried to accept it as something I'm okay with, but I'm, I'm sure not everybody will be. Okay, I think uh, the time is up and uh, we have to close. So once again, uh, Professor Lee, thank you so much for your presentation you, and your um, feedback at the Q&A session. We uh, enjoyed having you here at the TIU Global Dialogue.